Yes, so within the operational review database, there is a section where you can identify hazards within that property, yes. And looking down at 7.5, it says, where possible, the information gathered will allow, will allow the following to be achieved. And I'll just take you to the third bullet point, the formulation of a tactical plan in order to effectively implement appropriate operational procedures to mitigate risk. Uh, uh, and again, when you were doing your visits and entries into the ORD, did you know that the requirement of the policy was to, to allow the formulation of a tactical plan, in part? Again, yes, I, this isn't just um, single to Grenfell Tower. We have to, going back to that risk matrix, depending on how high it scores, there is a, a tactical plan, but there is, let's say, a, a pre-formed uh, document on, uh, electronically that allows you to populate uh, your tactical plan. So would it be fair to say that the tactical plan generated for any high-rise block, for example, or indeed any set of premises covered by this policy, that tactical plan would only be as good as the information on the ORD? Yes, that's correct. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. You can put um, anything. You don't have the policy bundle, or I do. I'm putting it away. I want to turn now to the night of the fire. Good. Would you so like a break? I just ask for a quick refreshment break before we yes, of course. carry yeah, on. Absolutely. Would five minutes be enough, do you think? That's fantastic. Yeah, right. You. you leave us now, then. I'll be coming after you in a minute. We'll rise to five minutes.
Right, well, Mr. Durden's on his way down. We'll have to wait just a short time until he's with us. Yes, Mr. Miller. Mr. Dowden, uh, I'm going to ask you about the first call out to Grenfell Tower now. Uh, on the evening of the 13th of June 2017, you came on duty at 8 pm. That's correct. And when reporting for duty on that evening, can you tell me who was the most senior officer on duty at North, North Kensington? That was myself. And I think you detailed two firefighters to the watch room. Yeah, we have um, one firefighter who will take uh, the primary role of um, looking after the watch room, receiving fire calls, um, inquiries from members of the public, uh, making log bookings, um, and then we have a what we call number two, his assistant, who um, will then, uh, if that, if he's called out or she's called out on a fire call, then at least we have someone else to man the, mm -hmm. to man that to man the watch room, so to, to facilitate the watch room. Yeah. Where, where is the watch room in the station at North Kensington? Um, it's, it's on the ground floor level, um, adjacent to the uh, appliance bay. Right. Now, I think you say in your statement that downtime started at midnight and you were resting after that point. Correct. Uh, what were the, do you know, what the rest of Red Watch were doing during downtime? Um, they would most probably be resting as well. And during downtime, is the watch room manned? Um, there is a facility to, to um, have someone present in the watch room. Um, the, the tendency will be that if a, a fire call is received, then it is a duty of the watch room attendant to make sure they are first into the watch room to receive that call and to start um, gathering the information in terms of from the uh, call, call slip that's on the teleprinter. And who was the watchroom attendant on duty uh, at and from midnight on the 13th, 14th of June? Remember? Without referring to my statement, I, 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 I can't no, I don't remember. Think it's in your statement. You don't remember? No. Okay. Uh, and um, in your statement on page one, you say... It's page two, actually. But you say that you got a call uh, at 0055 on the 14th of June to Grenfell Tower. Uh, do you remember when you did your statement where you got that time from? Um, the only reference I would have to that would either be one or two things from the actual um, I call them tip sheet, the information sheet that was available at the time or I reference that back into um, our mobilizer system where we have a, a sort of electronic log, our vision mobilizing system. Right. Vision, okay. Now you say that the mobilization call came through the watchman, the watch room. Do you remember who took that call? Not name specific, the, the, the um, assumption that it would be the uh, watch room attendant. Do you know or do you remember where the call came in from? The call comes from our, uh, our control centre. Control centre. Uh, uh, and uh, that night, I think it's, everyone knows, that was at Stratford. For later on, I understand that's correct, yes. yes. 
And is that the usual line of communication to a fire station in London, that the 999 call goes to control and then control call the watch room? That is generally what happens. Um, there is another sort of process to that we, we call running call. So if a appliance is mobile, um, and that means if they're not at a station, whether they're attending a, on the way back from an incident training session or a familiarisation visit, then um, if we're directly contacted by a member of public, then we can also almost self-mobilise, but we have to put that control in, uh, call into control. Right. OK. And in terms of communications between the control room at Stratford or Merton, uh, it, it, how does it work? Is there a landline or is it a radio communication no, or some other means? It's, um, so what happens is that we have a mobilising system at every station within London um, that when two, it's simultaneous activity, so when we receive a fire, fire call or any call to an incident, all lights will come on within a station. There's an audible warning or an audible sound, um, a mobilisation message, and that will denote um, the appliances from that station who are attending. At the same time, um, you, will have, you have a teleprinter in the watch room that will also basically um, come out of a piece of paper, and on that piece of paper, you have uh, various information res relating to that fire call or that incident. That's the address, the classification of incident, the appliances attending, mm -hmm. um, how that was mobilised, if it was a mobile number, if it was uh, an auto dialer or an AFA system, automatic fire alarm system, um, the appliances in, who are attending or in attendance. Um, so there's a, there's a range of information you can sort of gather from, from that, that piece of paper. And that piece of paper, is it sometimes called a tip sheet? That's correct. Right. <coughs> is, it, is it tip or is it TIP? Does it um, stand for anything? No, I, I just think it's a brigade terminology. Right. Yeah. OK. Uh, so it's an automatic system. Uh, it, what, what triggers it? Is it a computer message? or? It, as of that point in 2007, it's, it, we used, it, it's a computer-generated program. We right. used to, it used to be manually logged by control the mm. operators, and they would have to mobilise themselves. Now it, it's controlled by this uh, software system called Vision. And, and that is a computer-based software system that uh, basically manages the call, uh, calls coming in, uh, appliance mobilising, and the filtering down to station level as well. Okay. And the information on the tip sheet, where does that come from? That would be in, that would be from. Uh, again, I, I don't work in control, but from my knowledge, it's best to it. It will be from this software package Vision that has all the data inputted into it in terms of the resources. Clients available, their attributes, officers, and everything else. And um, what information about the premises would the tip sheet contain? You gave us a little list earlier, a little bit. Um, how much information about the premises would be contained on the tip sheet? Not so much on the tip sheet. With, with relation to high rise premise, there may be what we call an underwrite. So at the bottom of that tip sheet, um, if there's a particular um, comment logged against that uh, premise or building, that will be available on the tip sheet. And generally for high-rise premises, that will come up. This is a high-rise premise. I see. OK. Uh, casting your mind back to the night, could you describe for us the moment that you received the shout or the call? It's very difficult to be specific on, on the moment I see the call because, you know, the North Kensington is a busy operational fire station, so it's very difficult to differentiate mm -hmm. between the different calls that we receive. And at that time, I don't really remember anything that really stood out about, about the mobilisation, if I'm honest. How many mobilisations would you normally get a week? It's very difficult to put a number on it, very difficult, but... And this, this is just a, a very sort of vague recollection. You know, North Kensington, I think, is in certainly the top five, one of the top five busiest fire stations in London. Right. OK. So how many would you get a week? One or two, ten? <sighs> Pacific to a watch on your shift, a quiet period, it could be anything up to three or four or five. A busy period, it could be ten or more. Right. Right. 
Uh, and after the call came through, what happened next? Um, I mean, do you remember specifically or? Not, not specifically, but the, the general, you know, what will happen is that firefighters will um, you know, don their PPE rig, so it's their personal protective equipment, before they get onto the, the fire appliance. Um, and that's depending on whether on what machine they designated to, to ride. Um, <coughs> but I don't have anything, you know, in terms of that mobilisation that really sort of stuck out at, the, at that point. So, yeah. That was my next question. Was there anything unusual about that mobilisation that you'd want to uh, tell us about? I think the only thing that would generally be different about the mobilisation was, um, and now he was identified when he was en route to the incident, but at that point in time our, our PDA, which is our predetermined attendance to high-rise fires, was to, uh, for pumping appliances. Um, and at that point of mobilisation there was only um, three pumping appliances that have been um, allocated to that incident. Yes. And you say on page two that you were aware uh, that it's just four lines up from the bottom, uh, that 331 Kensington's pump ladder had also been deployed to Grenfell Tower. How, were you aware, how did you become aware of that? Um, that's part of the information that will be included on the tip sheet. Okay. So not just specific to the station, other appliances attending, <laughs> attending according to the predetermined attendance. Right. And you say uh, that... Uh, Pumps G271 and 272 were called. I think G2, G271 is your pump. That's correct. There's another word we use for, for fire engine or appliance. Yeah, in the, we use our um, phonetic, so in the London Fire Brigade, we don't refer to it as G, we refer to it as golf. But golf. It is, it is um, G. Yeah. Uh, as for a member of the public, they would understand that as G271. That's mm -hmm. correct. Right. So you had 271 and 272. What was the difference between 271 and 272? The, the difference is that um, as a watch manager, either A or B, you will ride uh, a pump ladder. Um, and then the, the Golf 272 will uh, generally will be in, uh, officer in charge of that, will be a crew manager. The only real difference is that the, one, uh, the pump ladder will have a 135 ladder, so that means it will extend to a maximum of 13.5 metres. And then on the pump, um, you will have a nine metre ladder. Right. In terms of communication abilities, um, are they the same or different? Uh, is, a pump, is a pump ladder the same as a pump in terms of its, its ability to communicate? So in terms of its radio yes. capabilities, yes. It also have the same main scheme radio, yes. Right. And just in terms of the people that were on the two, the two pumps, on G271, I think you had firefighter Danny Bills driving. Do you remember that? As far as my recollection uh, accounts, yes, that's correct. And I think you, you say you were next to him as watch manager in the front. That's correct. So he's driving, he's on the right, you're on the, 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 uh, the, the near side, I suppose. The on the left, near side, that's on correct. On the left. And immediately behind you, who have you got? So immediately behind me will be a... What, in terms of their name? Yes. <coughs> Without referring that to my statement, it'd be... Yes. I mean, we've got the list of people who, was there, who were there in the second paragraph on page two. We've got Danny Bills driving and Danny Brown, firefighter Danny Brown. Where was he? Do you remember where he was? I th again, this is a... I, I think he would have been behind myself um, because he was, uh, that's generally where the rider sits who is the watch room attendant because it's the closest position to the watch room. So it's the easiest play, way for them to get to the watch room onto the, the fire appliance. Right, I see, oh, I see. And then crew manager Charlie Batterby, where was he sitting? He would have been on the offside, so the uh, offside behind the driver. Right. And then Dave, 
No, I guess I often mispronounce his name. Is it Badillo or Badillo? Badillo. Badillo, right. And he was uh, also on G271. Where would he have been sitting? He would have been in between uh, either uh, Charlie and Danny in the middle. But not in the middle because it's, we have four seats across the, mm -hmm. across the rear of the cab. So he would have taken one of the vacant seats um, that were, were, were available in the middle of the clients. Right. So that night on G271, there were five of you. That's correct. And then on G272, you've listed Chris Secret as the crew manager, firefighter Tom Abel, who's driving, and in the back, firefighters Alex de St. Albin, Justin O'Byrne, and Chris Dorgu. Uh, that's correct. Yeah. Do you, I mean, you've put it in your statement. Do you remember that? Or, or have you looked at a document to refresh I, yourself? Yeah, I did look. I mean, I, I had to refresh, uh, refresh myself in terms of the ridership levels, and that was done um, from our style system, which is how we manage um, our personnel yeah. um, uh, software system. If you look at the uh, very bottom of page two, the top of page three, you're talking about what happens en route. And you say, I updated the members of my team in relation to the radio traffic from control and reminded them of the tactics in relation to high-rise buildings, breathing apparatus policies, the equipment required for the bridgehead and the fact that the bridgehead would be located two floors below the fire floor. <coughs> what did, do you remember, what did you tell them about the tactics that you were going to adopt at this fire? I don't think it was very much a specific in terms of individual you know, detailing of roles because at, at the point you receive the incident and at the point you're operational, there isn't really time to re have a real detailed briefing and that's why it's, obviously we, we have those on arrival tactics and theory sessions based back to the station. So it's more of a, and that's not re you know, related just to this incident, any incident I will get as an incident commander and, and, Every instant commander will adopt this who's on the front line pumping appliance. You know, we, it's a personal responsibility to update your crews if there's further traffic coming through in terms of, you know, uh, uh, if, if, uh, traffic in terms of persons reporting multiple calls. Um, and just to refresh um, the crews in, in terms of, okay, this is what we've got. This is the expectation. Um, you know, you know, it, would be, it would be naive of me to say here that, uh, that I detailed by very, very clear because you don't have time to do that since the command on, on the fire appliance. No. That's all part of the pre-planning. Part of the pre-planning. Yeah. Right. And how, I mean, how easy is it to have a four or five way conversation when you're donned in personal protective equipment and you've got a diesel engine running no. at speed? Yeah, it, 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 it is difficult. Um, but, you know, it's... it's I would still, if I get up um, radio traffic and updates, it's still very important to try and you know, get that radio traffic to, to the crew members. Now, you say in the next sentence, my appliance, you see it says there, uh, three lines, four lines down from the top of page three, my appliance has a mobile data terminal, MDT, on which important information about every premises can be accessed. This information concerning tactics, layout, number of flats, rendezvous points, and the location of dry risers plus any other information that may be useful when fighting a fire. Uh, I'll come to the next sentence about EPIP in a minute. But just focusing on that sentence for the moment, Mr. Dowden, um, uh, is, uh, my first question is, is a mobile data terminal present on every pump in the London Fire Brigade? Yes. Not just the pump ladders? No, it's, it's on the pump ladder and a pump. Right. Could you just describe for us, you're sitting in the cab, where is the mobile data terminal and what does it look like? So if, if this was my position in the, in the uh, fire appliance, um, the situation of the MDT is between myself and the driver. Right. And when you get on to the appliance at the start of a, of a call, a yes. shout, uh, does the mobile data terminal come on automatically or do you have to boot it up and switch it on? How does it so, work? At the same time the call is received at station, uh, because it's run from the same mobilising system vision, so the information that's on the tip sheet will also be duplicated onto the mobile data terminal. I see. And it's ready and on, is it, when you get into the cabins and go? 
there are not on this night. There are occasions that sometimes it is a computer system, and it does have glitches and failures. But on that night, yes, it was available. It was right. And can you interrogate it? Can you ask it questions? You, you, you can you can interrogate it. You can't answer it questions, but you, there is different. The, we just spoke about earlier the operational risk database. So the information that is collated um, from the ORD is um, available to access on your mobile data terminal. Right. So if you... Okay. And if you go to the... We've seen the ORD before. Um, perhaps just let's go back to it again. Could, can I just comment? One, one more thing that is important to, to comment on is that also we, um, we have a system where uh, it, it, we have to uh, identify control that we've sort of one, accepted the fire call. Um, so that is also the MDT. We have to. There's a green icon that flashes up, and we have to accept it. Also, we have a, another tab on the mobile data terminal, which is a status button. Right. Okay. So it's probably quite to, to explain the background on that. Yes, so status do. one is when any um, either pump or pump ladder is operational, ready at a fire station to respond to fire calls. Um, status two, which which will need to be pressed when you receive a mobilisation, basically means, yes, I've received that call at, fi at the fire station and we are proceeding to uh, the incident. Mm -hmm. Status three is when you're in attendance at the incident. Um, status six is when you're mobile. So that could be when you finish an incident and you're on, way, on your way back to station. If you're um, off on an off-site visit, station visit, um, you also have uh, status 15, which is mobile to standby. So if I get requested from control to stand by at another station, and I have to um, relay that information by pressing 15 on my MDT, and that confirms to control that I am mobile to stand by at a neighbouring station. Can I just, thank you, can I just get back to status one? Yeah. Uh, which you said, um, that's when you're operationally ready at a fire station to respond to fire calls. Um, who, is it in the fire station who makes you makes the crew status one? So, when for the the fire the, uh, the fire appliances, that will be the officer in charge. But we um, we can back that up with the watchman attendant because sometimes, as I said, it is a computer system. Sometimes there are errors and it can be delayed getting through. So, it is good practice also to make sure that we can make phone contact with control to confirm that that appliance is status one and operationally ready. Right. What, um, what, as it were, what button do you press to, to show your status one? It is literally a, a button with number one on it. In the, in the cab? In or the in MDT. The, on in the, the MDT, MDT. right. Yeah. It is. Okay. Touch screen. And so they're, they're all available, but they're all those statuses? All touch screen, yeah. Right. Thank you. Now, you say in your statement uh, that... Uh, you printed off, on, on route, you printed off the tactical plan details. Uh, and that's on page three, en route. Do you remember doing that? Yeah, I have a vague memory of, of, of actually having the, the printed out document in my hand, yes. Uh, can I just ask you about those tactical plan details? I'm not sure, I'm not sure we've got them as a document, but, but before I put a document to you to see if it helps with your recollection, what, what, did, the, what did the document tell you? What did the tactical plan, plan details tell you about what to expect? Uh, it will be, it's going to be difficult for me to reference exactly to that night, but from my knowledge previous to that night and after that mm -hmm. night, it, it's, it's, it's a, it, I wouldn't say a snapshot, but it, it gives you an overview of that operational risk database that's been uploaded. So it gives you a site profile in terms of the dimensions of the building, um, the height of the building, uh, the life risk, water supplies, um, any hazards within uh, that premise, and that's not specific to Grenfell Tower. That would be to any any um, yeah. any property that is um, subject to an operational review database uh, and a 72D program. Um, so any hazards within that premise, so if it's 
uh, uh, medical oxygen, if there's a hoard within the premise, any processes. Um, we can reference policy into it. Um, any fixed installations, um, your best site and route access. Um, <coughs> operational planning considerations, um, other agencies that we may need on, on scene. Right. So it's quite an information rich document if it's done right. If it's, as a, a reference to, if the data entry has been quite robust and it is correct, then yes. Can I ask you to look at um, a document in tab 13, Mr. Trial Director, of the bundle, the documents bundle, which is the, the ORD? We looked at it before. Let's have it up on the screen again, if we can. Uh, and if you turn, please, to the third page of this document. Well, perhaps we should go to the second page first, actually. Second page. And then, no, wrong, my fault. Third page, sorry. Right, um, you see the address, and this is on the ORD, and then there's a map. Do you remember whether that was information you got on the MDT on the night, or the kind of information, kind of information you would have got? It's the kind of information we get, but it's in a slightly different format. Right. Because that, that there, what we're showing there, is the actual sort of the, the station-based uh, desktop version. Right, I see. And if you turn the to the next page, there's something called, if you go to the next page, which is page, page four of the relativity reference, there's something called tactical plan. And it says tactical plan at the top, operational contingency plan, and then site details. Is that the tactical plan that you printed off? Not the exact tactical plan, because that copy we, we have there is the, the one that will be, again, at a, a station-based level through the station diary, so it's a desktop, that's a de desktop version. That's, it's very similar to one we can print off on the, uh, the, uh, at that point in June 2017, yes. Right. If you go to the top of the document, operational contingency plan, plan name Grenfell Tower, version one, date effective from, and we see 30th of October 2009, and then date documented the same, was, was the version that you printed off in the mobile data terminal, the weight of the Grenfell Tower fire, this version, or was it an updated version? I, I won't be able to confirm that. I, I, I would suggest it was that version, but yeah. yeah. OK. Well, let's see if we can just go through the, the document, seeing if, the, seeing if what you see on the page here was what you had on the night, or whether you, what you had on the night was more. You'll see site details. Uh, and you've got high-rise block of flats, 20 floors, and there's the dimensions and life risks, 400 persons, water supply, hydrants in adjacent roads, and then operational hazards, glass planing and coander effect. Do you remember seeing that on the night, or did you have more information? No, I, mean, I have, I do have a vague, you know, I have, I remember printing that document off, um, But if I'm, if I'm going to be honest, I, I don't have an absolute clear recollection of every single piece of information that I sort of gleaned from, from that uh, additional okay. uh, print off the appliance. Okay. And if, if you go to the next page, access, you'll see primary entry Grenfell Road, and it'll say by foot Bramley Road, and then site access, limited space for appliances, first engine to pull directly outside main entrance. Do you, re do you remember seeing that on? the mobile data terminal? Yeah. I, can't, I, I can't confirm whether you know, that's something. I, 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 I had it, but I can't remember specifically screwing down into no. to those areas. And just, just to try a couple of other things. Fireman's drop lift key opens main entrance door and all internal doors for 90 seconds should be should alarm be activating all internal doors unlocked. Do you remember en route seeing something about drop key? No. Uh, 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 and then under en route considerations, you'll see it in the last section or last box in the box in the bigger box on reconsiderations you see this building has a stay put policy do you remember seeing that on 
on the way to the Grenfell Tower fire. That's not something that I can remember that stands out. And it, particularly on the on route to, to the fire at Grenfell Tower, because as a commander, you've got, you know, you're on route, you're considerations, and I received the, you know, two bits of further traffic from, from control in terms of, um, you know, the, the additional appliance to make, it up, make the predetermined attendance and, you know, the additional call we received to Flat 16 and, my, you know, your focus sometimes can be taken away. So that's the only reason why, I, I, maybe, that I haven't taken that information down because I had, you know, f uh, you know further traffic from the control to, to deal with as well. Yes. Uh, yeah, R really what I'm seeking to get a handle on, Mr. Durden, is whether the document we're looking at here bears any relationship to what you m remember of what you saw on the mobile data terminal. Yeah. Uh, can I presume that, that that is as was on the night, yes. Okay. But if we find anything else, then I'll obviously ask okay. you that. Um, thank you. Now, in terms of... The usefulness of the information in the data, in the mobile t in the data in the mobile data terminal. Can you, in very brief terms, tell me what you learned when you looked at it uh, about the layout and fire safety features of Grenfell Tower prior to your arrival? I can't say that at that moment in point I, I learned anything, if I'm honest. Um, you know, I, I had had a familiarisation visit at Grenfell Tower. Um, so nothing sticks out in my mind, just you know, from the information from the uh, ORD that MDT that I had learned anything. Well, let me just test it a little bit by asking you some specific questions and if, if you don't know you don't know but did you learn anything from the mobile data terminal about the height of the building and the number of floors I, I, I do remember from if I'm honest I do remember that's one of the things I, I have a vague remember in terms of the number of floors and the height of the building that's something I, I did clean off the uh, right did you learn anything about the nature of the evacuation plan for Grenfell Tower that had been devised by uh, the premises fire risk assessment or any other plan? Was that on the, you asked asking if that was on the MDT? Well I'm asking you whether, well I'm asking you whether you learnt anything from the MDT about the nature of any evacuation plan for Grenfell Tower. I can't say I learnt anything because I don't think that information was, from what I understand, available. Mm -hmm. Did you learn anything about who to talk to, who to identify or contact as the responsible person responsible for Grenfell Tower? <laughs> Not at that moment in time, no. Did you, did the MDT information give you anything about evacuation routes or protected staircases? Do you remember? I don't remember, no. Mr Chairman, it's, it's 3.30, and I know we've yes. had one short break this morning, this afternoon. Perhaps we should have another. Well, you're going to be moving on to other matters soon, yes, aren't I you? Am. Well, that probably would be a good idea. And you'd probably like a break as well, Mr Dowd. Yes, please. Right, well, we'll have a short break now. Let's say 10 minutes, that should be enough. Okay. All right, and we'll be back here then, if you would, at uh, 20 to 4. OK, you, you leave us now. And yeah, she will help you out.
I think Mr. Dowden's been or is being called, so we'll only just have to wait a moment. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, can I just say I, I, I'm detecting that the witness is tired. Yes. And he's been under uh, a lot of pressure all day. Um, I think I would like to finish off a particular line with him, but I would suggest if, if it's all right with you, we finish at four o'clock. Well, you, you take your time, um, but if we can finish slightly on the early side, I think that would be a good thing. Very well. Mr. Chairman, I've just had information. I think Mr. Dowden is not feeling able to continue today. Oh, really? Um, that is what I'm told. So um, um, I, I think, in fairness to him, I think we would do we would get more out of him, and he would be able to serve us better if we were to stop now and um, resume tomorrow morning. Well, I certainly don't want to uh, ask him to go on if he's not able to do so, or not not feeling fit to do so. Um, Mr. Millet, I've been becoming increasingly concerned during the course of the day that Mr. Dowden is finding this a difficult exercise and I'm very conscious that we are about to get to that part of the story which he's likely to find most difficult to deal with yes. and I'm asking you but through you those who are responsible for his welfare to consider whether giving evidence in this way is the best thing for him uh, we need to have his evidence um, but we need to take whatever steps we can to ensure that he is as comfortable as possible and therefore able to give us the best evidence that he can. It may be that we could make other arrangements. They aren't in place at the moment, but I think they could be put in place fairly quickly. But I would need some guidance from others as to whether that is desirable and whether he would feel more comfortable doing that or not. I'm very conscious of the fact that he is clearly an officer who takes his position very seriously and might not wish to give evidence in another way. He may feel that it's part of his duty to give evidence from the witness box in the ordinary way. Yes. So I wouldn't want to make an order about that without uh, knowing what his own reaction would be. No. But can I just raise that as a possibility? And maybe those who uh, are in touch with him could explore that possibility. Yes. Um, I, I didn't remind him as he left that he's not to talk to other people about his evidence, but I make it clear now that he can talk to other people about the manner in which he gives evidence at the inquiry, and I would welcome any assistance that I can be given on that front. Yes. Well, he'll be, I'm, I'm sure he'll be reminded of, of the requirement not to discuss his evidence with anybody overnight. But in terms of the arrangements, perhaps the best thing, Mr Chairman, is if I speak to uh, Mr Walsh and Mr Seward about what arrangements can be made to um, get, get the best, take the best evidence from him we can during tomorrow. Yes. And it may be that we have a different arrangement. We'll try and put that in place as fast as we can well, overnight. Well, I can say, I, I think it would help me if we could, if you could have that conversation as soon as possible. Yes. And, and let me know what the outcome of it is, because once I know that, we can... <coughs> speak to the technical people and get um, any, any necessary changes put in place. Yes, yes. Well, well right. Mr Chairman, I think we'll, we'll do that and take it, take it from there. Can I ask that we at least notionally signal a start of 9.30 tomorrow morning again? I, I'm conscious I've got quite a lot of material still to go through with this witness. Yes, and, and just so that people understand, it's not that we are feeling masochistic. The problem we have with the firefighter witnesses is that they are... Uh, they are here in accordance with a rotor, which, it's, which has been agreed to fit in with their own uh, professional rostering arrangements. So we can't just change them in order to soothe ourselves, otherwise we shall interfere with uh, the London Fire Brigade's arrangements. So we do need to try and keep up to schedule, and I think for that reason it's wise to start a bit earlier tomorrow and possibly the day after. We'll see how we go. And if we have an early end of the afternoon, we shan't have done quite as badly as we would otherwise have done. So I'm going to rise now and say that I'll sit again at half past nine tomorrow, and we'll resume with Mr. Darden then. Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs>